He told us that at the point, the first time that he smoked weed, it felt, he felt normal for the very, very first time. And he assumed that that's what other people felt like. And that when he wasn't using, it felt like something was missing. And so one of the things that we've learned, and this will all come together in my journey, but one of the things that we've learned is that in the world we live in, there's so much stress and anxiety that we put on every human. And it can be especially tough for kids. And depending upon how the kids are wired, there ultimately is this hole, right, where they're trying to fill it. And we try to fill things externally instead of internally. And with that, I welcome a long time I would say friend. Ron and I don't know each other that well personally. I'd say friend because Ron is someone that I have learned immensely from. And I'll share that origin story here in a sec. But this is this is my friend, Mr. Ron Hill. And Ron, first, welcome to the show today, sir. How are you? Thank you, Matt. I am amazing. I'm super excited to be here. And um, you mentioned friend. And I'm not sure we've actually been in the same room with each other. But I feel like everybody I meet through Exchange, we go deep. It's rich from the very beginning, and yeah, it feels um, feels like the right kind of friendship where we can Thank just you. talk I'm, about what needs to be talked about, and yeah, absolutely. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't like surface level. I don't like uh, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good. All right. I, I, it's 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 an amazing day. You're you're doing really well today, and I love to go deep. Uh, I love to have real conversation. I think exchange community really, really does that for people. And so we could talk about, we probably will talk about exchange a lot today. Uh, before we, we dive into exchange, just I, I love to share an origin story with the audience before we dive into the challenges. The origin story of how I met Mr. Ron Hill, it dates back to 2019. Pardon me. It dates back to, uh, yeah, it dates back to 2020, uh, one, 2021. He spoke in a panel when I was being exchange trained. He was the very first speaker I heard at exchange training. And I was blown away. I was super impressed. And I loved everything that I learned from Ron then. And now it's just uh, you know coincidence or divine intervention. Call it what you will. We get an opportunity to really reconnect here. So real pleasure to, uh, to meet again and really learn together and share with our audience today some of the challenges and some of the, the light and energy you're bringing to the world, Ron. So real pleasure. Real pleasure. And as we dive in, uh, we like to go. We like to go deep into the challenging stuff. And the the challenging stuff here, I know we've got plenty of places we could go. So let's let's dive in, shall we? What is something that's been incredibly challenging for you in your life that we can start to to share with the audience and share? Really, yeah, let's get started. So, what's that challenge for you, Ron? Perfect, um, Matt. Well, I just want to acknowledge, before I jump into that, I want to acknowledge you because you did such a gracious job of acknowledging me. And I think it's really interesting because you never really know where you actually have impact on somebody. I didn't realize that I was the first person that you heard to exchange. Um, yeah. But I also recall the first time I was in a breakout room with you and just the energy, like the amazing energy that you brought to the conversation. Um, so anyway, so I appreciate about you. So I wanted to acknowledge that as we started. Um so, yeah, so it's interesting thinking about especially challenges, like what I would say on the far side of, maybe even on the far side of the challenge or far side of the complexion, because it almost seems once you start to get the lessons from those, like, was that really like a great challenge? But as I mentioned mm -hmm. to you, one of my, um, my great challenges probably is being a parent. But mm -hmm. the biggest, one of the biggest challenges of our family was when my, 16 year old son, he was barely 16, uh, our oldest son. And, you know, we thought we were doing a lot of the right things, but we were a little bit confused at what was happening. And then, and literally, before we knew it, um, he had a drug and alcohol issue. Mm. Uh, and we found ourselves um, sitting in um, a program in Kansas City sitting with the head of that program as my son was going into an outpatient program um, for drug and alcohol addiction. And one of the things that, that I had said was that, you know, like how soon can you fix him? Um, and, you know, when can we get back to life? It's um, and I laugh at that now because I was like, well, we're, you know, we go to the lake in the summer and we've got all this stuff. And um, David Roberts was the head of the program. And he said, well, you know, 
honestly, like this is a family issue. It's not just your son. And here's actually what's going to change for you guys and your family. So that was, um, it, it was a point where I would say it was the call to adventure. Um, and I, the process that I thought about that and it took me a few a few times to be able to answer that call. So anyway, before, I don't know if you want to like interject before I just kind of keep yeah, rambling. I, I'd with that. love to. Like, yeah. like that, that was the, the, this big challenge for us as a family where suddenly, you know, one day we're raising our teenager, the next day we're sitting in um, a group session with a bunch of parents that are all have the same challenge um, and very much like exchange suddenly we find ourselves going like super deep with these people we don't even know um, so anyway it was an yeah. interesting interesting crossroads this is a I'm so glad you're sharing this and thank you for you know, having the courage to share this transparently Ron this is a, a, a blind spot for me a fear for me because when I was growing up uh, I was I had a highly overprotected strict parent up, upbringing i was an only child so they had their eyes on me and I, I didn't i didn't have any experience with drugs or alcohol until i got to college you know, with with the alcohol at least right so uh, i i wouldn't know what to look for uh i wouldn't i wouldn't know any of this it would be a complete shock and surprise uh to me to see uh this happen in my family so when you say drug and alcohol issue like is this what what alcohol what drug if if you could distinguish that what what, what was the issue well, I think I, as I look back on that, um, it the issue really started um, mm -hmm. with marijuana. And yeah. I'm probably dating myself as I say marijuana or pot or weed, I think is what the kids call it today. Um, uh -huh. And it, it started literally when I think it was, uh, you know, heading to a sporting practice uh, at high school when he was very young and he tried one thing. And for him... Um, he, he told us that at the point, the first time that he smoked weed, it felt, he felt normal for the very, very first time. And he assumed that that's what other people felt like. Um, and that when he wasn't using, it felt like something was missing. Mm. And so one of the things that we've learned, um, and, and this will kind of all come together in my journey, but one of the things that we've learned is that, um, in the world we live in, there's so much stress and anxiety that we put on every human and it can be especially tough for kids. And depending upon how the kids are wired, um, there ultimately is this hole, right? Where they're trying to fill it and we try to fill things externally instead of internally. And so mm -hmm. sometimes that there's all kinds, it could be food, uh, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be pornography. It could be all of these things that we use to try to fill that emptiness inside of us as a human being. So that's what was happening with him at the time. He was trying to find a solution, and that seemed to be the best solution for him at the time. And then that very quickly accelerated for him trying a, a bunch of different stuff. Luckily, he came to us within a year of this all happening okay. and said, I need help. I'm out of control. I need help. And I don't know what to do with this. Wow, that's impressive that he was able to even be aware that he had a challenge and that he did come to you. So, yeah, we felt, I mean, looking back, very lucky because there's a lot of families that don't, you know, the family recognize it before either the child or it could be the parent that actually is the, um, the addict in that case. Well, from the conversation you had with the, uh, the doctor of the outpatient program who had you'd ask him the question, how soon can you fix him? And he talked about it's a family opportunity, a family issue. From that conversation forward, uh, what was your your wife's internal journey together? What, what was that like for you? Well, for me, and I'm trying to, as I think back, like it, all of that time period was a bit in slow motion. Uh, that was six years ago at this point. And so it's a bit in slow motion, but, you know, for me, I, I tend to be a fixer. So it's like, okay, what can I do, you know, to fix somebody else's problem? And ultimately I called um, a friend of mine, a guy by the name of Jake Clark, and he runs a program that's called Save a Warrior. Okay. 
Um, and Stanford Warrior is a program for military veterans and first responders that um, allow them to get their life back. And um, and so anyway, I met Jake through a chance encounter and he had this impact on me and I knew he was in recovery. So I called him and I said, hey, I just want to talk this through because I want to understand what my son's life is going to be like. Right. You've got three children and you're like you want the best for them. And, you know, suddenly you have this concern that like maybe there's this challenge and like what like, like what kind of hardship? Like what's this going to be like? And and Jake said to me, um, I want you to come and witness at a cohort for Save a Warrior. And I'm like, well, I just like I have all these questions. And he's like, dude, like, come like are you coming in August or September. Like you don't have a choice. Like you need to come witness. And I said, I'm not sure that, I don't know how I get in a position to really help people. And he said, September or August. And I said, I'll be there in September. Um, so ultimately, like we made it through that summer. My son got out of outpatient. And then it was a beautiful program where they connect these kids and they make being in recovery a lot more fun than being high. And so he was on his journey. We actually had a whole family event that we went to in Denver. Um, it was like a family concert with all of these kids and families in recovery. And so from there, I flew out to California to save a warrior. I got off the plane and somebody picked me up and they said, what branch of the military are you in? And I'm very proud. And I'm like, well, I, I'm not in the military. I'm here as a witness. And the gentleman said, there are no witnesses. Welcome to 046. And suddenly, like I had this fear, this fear just fear wash over me. I got in a van with two other people. Nobody said a word. And I headed off to this week long retreat, which absolutely changed everything for me. Wow. Please, stop here. please tell us more about this retreat. Cause uh, uh, you're, you're, you're touching at something that may be a secret that some of us have out there. It may be really difficult to talk about and to find someone who can talk about it. Just, Massive respect for you, Ron. Please continue. We're, we're all ears. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I, I went to Save a Warrior, and it is. I heard Jake say, the head of the program, that um, they basically um, open you up, shove a boot in your chest, and then put you back together and send you on your way at the end of the week. <laughs> and so it was just a. It was a very quick, deep dive for me into trauma, and yeah. and so much of the um these amazing men and women that had been in military service some of them first responders and they had so much trauma not just from the work that they did but also what did or did not happen while they were growing up and what i learned is that we all carry trauma in some form um our body remembers this trauma and then we can act out um in many ways as we start to get older and so you know, bringing this back to the challenge with my son, you know, I realized that, you know, so much of, like, I didn't cause what happened to my son, um, but I could be a better version of myself. And ultimately, I, as I went deep into the work, I started meditating. Um, I had this great cohort that I was part of that we stayed in communication for a long time as we were on this journey to be better versions of ourselves, And so as I really, as I, as I started to let go of control and become a better version, I became a better father and I gave my son the space to heal. I mm -hmm. became a better leader and I allowed my company the space to grow and my leaders the space to become the best version of themselves. Um, my wife and I were doing this together. Our relationship became richer and became stronger. And so that was just this aha moment for me that, and, and, and John Berghoff has said this, and I know it didn't come from him, but I attribute it to him. If I am not the problem, then there is no solution. And I heard John say that one day and I wrote that down and I resonated with that because that was really this experience of my own, the catalyst for me to become the best version of myself as a leader. And so I knew that was an inspiration for ultimately the work that I wanted to do in the world. Wow. I know that was a uh, lot. I just threw out there. 
that was a lot. Let's park it for a second because there's two things that are really coming to mind here. And uh, first, I'll just make a statement. If I'm not the problem, then there is no solution. I love that. That is like a personal philosophy. What is it I can own about me and own about my part of this, own about everything in my life? What is it I can own? And if yeah. I feel that it's someone else, then where's my blind spot that I'm not seeing? That's what I've been coached to believe. So I, I, I love that you finished with that. Before you said that, though, is where I want to unpack. You said the words, when I let go of control, and then your yeah. relationship with your wife got better, your, your business, your teammate, your employees, things uh, grew and expanded from there. Can you talk about what does that mean to you, letting go of control? Well, I've spent, um, you know, and it, it's interesting as I unpack just how I grew up and some of the, the challenges. And, and you know, it's interesting because trauma is not what happened to us, but how we respond to what happened to us. So some of us could have very simple things that don't seem traumatic, but the way we respond to them, we tend to, it, it anchors in our, in our body and we carry that with us. Um, and so I just got completely distracted on the questions you asked me as I oh, started. Oh, dude, it totally happens to me all the time. I'm with you. So I, <laughs> it started with le letting go of control, right? Letting go of control yeah. and what yeah. that means to yeah. you. Yeah. So, so I had spent so much time trying to control every situation. I don't know whether it was like a protective mechanism um, and it was this need to be a perfectionist. Yes. Um, I'm a firstborn. I read this book growing up firstborn. And I kind of have this pride with being the, or I think they call it the, the discouraged perfectionist, right? Because we can never really be a perfectionist. And so it, I felt like that, that kept me at arm's length from people that I loved. Um, it made it difficult because my standards were so high for people that work for me that they could never actually, um, please me or, you know, there would always be something better that could be done. So as I started to let go of control and realizing like some of the stuff that I acted like I had control over, I didn't like my son. I mean, we, you know, your, your kids are young, but like this, the, the learning that we really have no control over our kids. And for a very long time, I had people like, Oh, well, you just need to control your kid when you go into a store or you just need to do that. Like there's just, there's so much that's out of our control that on the back side of that, this idea that if I'm not the solution, that uh, if I'm not the problem, that there's no solution is almost like this freeing, right? Because we can let go of all the other stuff and just realize like, like what is it I'm resisting or how can I show up in a better way? Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Well, what, what's a what's a practical example? You talk about your business and letting control in your business. I mean, the way that I know you professionally is that you are very successful in business. Uh, you have a, a successful organization. We're going to get to that in a little while, over 25 years. So when you say letting go of control in your business and that changed everything, what's a, a practical example of the way maybe you used to do it? And then after you let go of control, what's that example? Well, it could be like the minutia of, let's say, a leader that works for me, like whether it's sales or HR. And like with me really being able to get into the minutia and ask all of these detailed questions or wanting somebody to do it my way, which is not the right way, but would be a preference factor. And then ultimately, you know, through this whole journey, we became purpose driven. I found conscious capitalism. And, and ultimately, you know, the letting go of control is really how do we fulfill the purpose and how do we show up and do we live the core values of the organization? And in between, the details are less important. And so that creates less angst for me. It creates, creates a better relationship with um, the people on my team. And so that's, that's probably like a really good example. And I think there's ways around the household that I've let go of those things. Some people might say I still have some of them. I, some of them <laughs> hold on to and, it, and I do feel that conscious leadership is the journey of a lifetime. So I, I do feel like we always have room for improvement. 
Uh, so hold on here. We're three weighing in. Uh, Ron Hill's wife is now live with us. Uh, Miss Hill, can you tell us an example? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so what, yeah, what might be an example there? Because I, I identify with some of the things you're sharing. This this idea of, of kind of a, a recovering perfectionist. At least that's what I would say. Recovering perfectionist and having yeah. control. Yeah. And how does that show up now that you've let go with your spouse? Um. Well, I would say with my spouse and also with my kids, it is much more about curiosity than it is about a particular way of doing things. And and I would completely admit that probably with my wife is the the hardest piece of that and probably the last thing to let go, because there's times where I still have preference factors on the way that things get done, but really just being curious and... um, and, and I think, I think even at home, I think in terms of process and that okay. like, how, can we, how can we be more efficient? It doesn't necessarily need to be my way or her way, but when we can be curious and have a discussion, then maybe we can find a better way and a better solution, which is really the unlocking the collective wisdom, which can be done actually at home or really any place. Tell me if this is in the ballpark, because this is, this is highly important to me and our audience. This, this idea of being curious. It's one of my core values is, is curiosity. So I'm feeling when it comes to being curious, the example would be uh, my wife wants to use QuickBooks and run our finances in a very specific way, that way. And my way is get together at the dining room table once a week on Sunday and look at my spreadsheets that I took a long time. They look great. And they're very detailed and, and I love it. And she wants to simplify it that way. And this is a headbutting at some point in the past because I want to do it this way. I want her to do it this way. Yeah. And now she's running it and she wants to do it her way. And that was a headbutt. So the curiosity yeah. is being open to living the purpose and the values of our family. It's not do it my way. And right. when I let go of that, our conversations around finance are now different and they're a little better. Yeah. That's- well, How, yeah, and I would say it sounds like, right, she's willing to own that and to take that. Yes. Yes, I couldn't get over that I'd spent all this time creating this system, and now I'm going to hand it to her to run it, and she wants to do it a different way. That makes sense to her yeah. on her terms, and I couldn't get over that. That right. was perfectionist attached to the control. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, which I probably I read it with. I completely understand, and... Yeah, and I, I, with our spouses, sometimes like literally, that's the really, really hard work. With our kids, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard with our team, but it seems to be less hard with our team than it does with our spouses. Especially, I would think mixing work and yeah. and relationship. Yeah, I wonder how how over over time being being curious, letting go, control how this. How this played out for you during this time of going through the boot camp of, you know, you're with your son, you're at the outpatient place, you go through the boot camp, you're, this is six years ago. Uh, How has your heart changed, your, your thinking changed with your son since all of this happened, Ron? Yeah, so we, you know, I I came back from Save a Warrior and that was a week, like it was just this small piece in time, but it, it shifted my perspective to realize like, oh, I have some stuff to work on. And I also came back and I had, um, I worked on the relationship with my dad, um, which was a big part of what I talked about um, when I was at Save a Warrior. And I came back and I, I took a lot of responsibility and I had this really beautiful conversation with my father. And I would say that's changed our relationship. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I watch literally like, I would say like it, I use the term space a lot. Sometimes people struggle with what I mean by that, but all of a sudden my, the relationship with my father was, became very spacious. Um, mm-hmm. so like there's room for both of us in the relationship. There's room for curiosity. There's room for challenge. Um, and that was because I took a hundred percent ownership of how I had showed up in the past. And so that really led me to, okay, how do I, how do I leverage that with my son and how do I let, how do I let go of the control and I let him be on the journey 
And I just, as an example, when he went into his recovery program, I took my, I had a document and there was 30, maybe 40 bullet points of a contract um, for my son. And I laugh at this. And uh, the head of the program, David Roberts, he's like, this is really amazing. He's like, can we get it down to three? Oh, you came up with the 40 bullet points and gave it to him. He's like, like, here's all the stuff that he needs to stay, you know, agreed to. And then he signs and and I I ran my company like that one way instead of like, oh, can we just co-create three things that we can agree on? And that like, and these are just not, they become non-negotiable. So that was also a way to let go of control because now we were, we were partnering or unlocking our collective wisdom. I probably wouldn't have used that term at the time. Mm. Uh, and so then that became, and so anyway, like whenever I would learn a lesson there as a father, I could use that at work because it, it was the same. Like it's the, like I think our journey as leaders, it's the same whether we're at home or whether we're at work. And at the Conscious Leaders Plus, which is kind of the culmination of all of this journey, you know, it's interesting because we've had people that have come through that want to be a better spouse or they want to be a better parent. And that's the same work to show up better as a parent as it is to show up better as a leader in our company or organization. Mm. Well, I'd love to I'd love to go into that realm and, and kind of move to the business side of it, because I know you've been in business for 25 plus years successful, what I would deem successful. I know you've had impact on me. Can you talk about why did you decide to get into the line of work? Just what do you do? Why did you decide to get into that line of work, Ron? Well, um, today, the um, like to simplify this, I'm going to talk about the Conscious leader, Leaders Quest, and then I'll give a little bit of background on that. Okay. Um, and so with the Conscious Leaders Quest, we help uh, modern leaders discover the best version of themselves. And we believe that when a leader can do the work to discover the best version of themselves, then they are much more likely to build companies that solve the world's problems, or as we would say, cultivate positive change in the world. And when I think about making impact, like you look around, you just watch the news, you're like, oh my God, there's so much stuff going on. And that like the simplest thing is if we each can work to become the best version of ourselves, it creates ripples. And I think if we're not the best version of ourselves, it literally can send out tsunamis from us in how we create harm um, and destruction. And I think this is happening in companies right and left. And people don't even realize the way that they actually become a stressor um, or become a demand to the people that work for them. And so I think we get to change the world when we we start looking at ourselves. And just to kind of back that up, I had, you know, early on, I worked for several different companies with culture that I very quickly decided I do not want. I don't want to work in an organization where I have anxiety and I have fear and I do my best work and then somebody yells at me because they have their own issues going on. So I started a company called Redemption Plus, and that's been over 25 years ago. I've since sold that company. But the idea was that at the time, I would have said to create work-life balance. And in this idea of how do we just live our life? And today, I would say it's a congruence, which I'm still working on this today. And so we set out to do this at Redemption Plus, and there's many different mistakes that were made along the way. Like listening to my old school mentor, they're like, well, you have to be profitable and really successful, and then you can treat people well. You know, in the meantime, you need to have some fear in the organization and, you know, all of these kind of old school things that just do not work. So I ultimately find, found my balance with that. We found um, purpose. And as we grew at one point, the more we grew, the less we had on the bottom line. And there was all this process and waste and rework and um, things I had no experience with just being an entrepreneur and um, having a background in finance. And um, so I learned about purpose and ways and we work and process. And so as we became purpose driven, I then found this organization called Conscious Capitalism um, with the purpose of elevating humanity through business. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I've been trying to articulate. So we built 
Redemption Plus around this idea on how do we elevate humanity through business. And so we ultimately ended up with purpose, mission, vision, values, and behaviors that became a framework for alignment and clarity in the organization. And then once we really started operating within that framework, things became easier. We became more profitable. Our processes became better. We had less waste and rework. So that was really this idea that um, on how we really doubled down, what I would say around purpose. And then this idea that in conscious capitalism, conscious leadership is one of the four tenets. And if I was drawing this out, I wouldn't put conscious leadership, I may have said conscious capitalism, but I wouldn't put conscious leadership as an equal tenant in conscious capitalism. Because if we're not conscious leaders, we're not going to build conscious organizations. We're probably not going to build purpose-driven organizations. Okay. And the more we become awake or aware of our actions and we start to work on those, then the more likely we are to realize the impact that we have in the corporation um, or small business. And it's, but it, and it's this idea that there are no trade-offs in business, mm-hmm. that actually the better, the more work we do on ourselves, the better we treat our employees, actually the more profitable that we become. And it's not the other way around, and there doesn't have to be any trade-offs there. I love everything you're sharing, and I know that there's a listener out there right now who's hearing this, and they feel that they are working on themselves, and at the same time, they may have a blind spot. They may be causing these tsunamis they don't even realize, and I'm wondering, uh, how would I know that I'm causing tsunamis? Like, How would I become aware of these tsunamis? Uh, Quick answer, hire Ron, everyone, and at the same time, uh, what... How would I even know? How would I become aware, Ron? Um, Matt, like that is such a great question. And if we can come up with an answer to that, then it will solve so many problems for me. You know, yeah. like yeah. I'm still pondering the answer to that question. For me, it was the journey with my son that was the catalyst. I feel that there are leaders that are making money and sometimes they're making so much money the old fashioned way that they just continue to do it that way. Because when we look inside and we start to deal with our baggage and the way we show up, it can be, it can be messy. It can be complicated. But, but what I would say is that it, as a leader, if we can look at conscious leadership as the journey of a lifetime and that we always have work to do on it. And you, know, you work with leaders, you're a coach, One of the things that I found was that if you're leading a company, actually, I think if you're a human being, you should have a coach. Um, If you're leading a company, you should have a coach because you can't see your blind spots. And it was when I started working with my own coach, which came after um, the Saber Warrior stint. And before that, I would have felt like, like, I don't really need a coach. Like, I got it figured out. But it didn't. And so this is a long answer here. I said, leaning into this curiosity and is what you're doing today, is it working for you? Um, Like, how does it feel? And along this journey, I mean, ultimately, we have this internal wisdom. And so much of my journey was spent running spreadsheets and up in my head. And that when I can really sink down somatically and I can get into my heart and I can understand, like, like the the answers are all there. And I would say if somebody really stopped to listen, right, they're going to know if they've got blind spots. Mm -hmm. I think we know that, but we're so, there's so many distractions these days that I think it's easy to avoid it or not to hear it because we're not listening for it because, you know, we're on social media or we're worried about you know, what people we don't know are saying about us. On, on the major Instagram. distraction. That's right. Other people's Some opinions. Distractions. And, and I think that the world and, and many businesses and technology are wired to cause stress and anxiety. And they're doing a really, really great job. And I think as leaders, we're allowing this to happen. We're also allowing it to happen to our children. I could probably go off for a lot. Well, I can I can go off with you on this one. I tend to believe that we may feel if we run a social media company that we are doing the best to bring out the best in people, and the side effect of that is 
we're causing this thing that's fear of other people's opinions and wanting to be compared and comparison is one of the biggest evils out there. So I, I, I agree yeah. with what you're saying. Uh, it's, th- there are a number of places out there that, that this shows up. You said a word though, that I don't know if everyone knows what it means. You said, feel it somatically. Uh, yeah. and I'm curious when you say feeling it somatically, uh, if I've never heard that word before, or if that just went through my head and I don't really know the depth of it, can you talk a little bit about what feeling it somatically in your body? What does that mean to you, Ron? Yeah, well, you, you just said feeling it somatically in your body, which is, you know, somatic is is feeling. So we, um, at the Conscious Leaders Quest, I mean, part of our process is that what we do is cognitive and it is somatic. And so as a leader, when we show up, when we understand how we show up in our body, then we can start to show up in a better way. And a great example is that, um, and this is the work um, of probably our mutual friend, Dr. Dan Friedland, right? When we come into a meeting and we have, we're in a state of fight or flight in our body, right? We might come in, we have anxiety, carrying all this stuff, and we walk into a room we're going to bring that with us. And Mm. so when we're carrying stress and anxiety in our body and we come into a meeting and we start to share that, then suddenly we have a whole room of people, probably the leaders of the company that are in fight or flight or in anxiety and distress. But when we can learn the skills to be able to be more comfortable in our bodies and to show up in cycles of giving and receiving, then that's also contagious, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we, like I might say, when we lead with love, so anyway, so going back to somatic, it really is how we're actually physically showing up in our body. And I had uh, my coach for a long time, Steve Havel, used to always, and this isn't his thing, but I love the way he said it. He said, you know, my grandmother used to say, what you're doing is speaking so loud that I can't hear what you're saying. And so it's important to understand that how do we react to things and how do we physically show up and what does it feel like in our bodies as leaders? You're, you're saying words and I've done some somatic uh, coaching as in how your coach should be my somatic coach. And these are some of the things that have brought out things that me used to identify as very cerebral. Now I, I view this, the, the heart and the mind uh, as, as joined before it was, I'm cerebral. And sometimes I turn on this empathy thing, the somatic coach brought that out of me. And I found myself all of a sudden crying like a baby. don't know why. And all of a sudden all this stuff comes out. And I have this freedom or this lightness, uh, because yeah. of working with a somatic coach. And so that's, that's why I want to dive into it. Cause if you haven't heard of somatic coaching or really be able to feel it, there's a way to unlock this part in your body. I think that's what you're describing. Uh, yeah, and that it was one of the things with our um, leading our first Conscious Leaders Quest cohort last April that so many of the testimonials from people said it was the first time I felt I really understood how I was showing up in my body. And it was interesting um, because we did some work where I actually understood some new edges for me. So I think like literally this is the journey of a lifetime. And I think when we when we understand as a leader, we're on this journey. And you know, I may not know what work I'm gonna do tomorrow. I just signed up for a new program that just looked amazing. And so like like you just never know, like what is the next thing on our journey that's gonna help us continue to unlock um mm-hmm. you know, to unlock the wisdom within us and help us really be comfortable in a way that helps other people. And and the easiest way to say that is to be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we as humans are the best version of ourselves, then we allow others to be um, who they are and to be a whole person and not have to compartmentalize by saying, oh, I have to leave that part of me at home because my job doesn't appreciate that piece of of who I am as a human being. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I know when I first went to work, in the early 90s, I was somebody gave me advice. I said, you know what? Leave your personal shit at home. Show up early, work hard, and you'll be successful. And it also, it felt so disconnected for me to go, oh, yeah, but I have this other stuff, <laughs> which has only gotten, it's only magnified over time. Once like you get married, and you have a family and like we, like, we all have all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think we have to learn how to, 
how to carry it and be very congruent on our journey. Exactly. Congruency and own it and carry it and don't leave it at home and forget about it. Suppress yeah. it. Put it in a lockbox. Learn to own it and yeah. uh, harmonize with everything going on in our lives and in the world is yeah. what I feel. Uh, and and When we lock it up, it gets bigger, I think. Yes. Oh, yes, it does. It does. It, it gets angry until it comes out uh, in some way when you lock it up. Uh, and uh, I, I look at, because I, I follow on Instagram some of the things you've done. And I believe I saw you, if I'm not mistaken, in Costa Rica, not some too, too long ago, uh, on one of your Conscious Leader Quest cohorts. And I believe, if you could talk a little bit about that, I believe you have one coming up for those who want to take their game to the next level and be able to think, feel, and do everything we're talking about, let go. Please talk about your cohort, Ron. Yeah, so the, the Conscious Leaders Quest um, is a partnership that I have with Michael Dietrich Chastain and Peter Katz. And my journey, ultimately, if I kind of go back and I shared a little bit about Save a Warrior and I started working with a coach and things started to change and started to let go of control. And I found that like, oh, like there's this formula for how to be more comfortable, for me to be, how to be more comfortable in my own skin, how to show up who I am naturally and have people sometimes stop me and go, hey, like what's going on? Because I've noticed you're a different version of yourself. And um and I still occasionally have people come up and they're like, like I want to figure out like what's going on with you because of, of how you're showing up in the world. Uh, and hopefully that con continues to be in a positive way. That's the positive ripples um, are what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately the idea was like, how do I continue that journey? But how do I help others along that journey? And thinking about what's the difference that I want to make in the world and if we can help leaders show up as the best version of themselves, in one way it sounds so simple, in another way it's really complex, then I think we get to change the world. So the Conscious Leaders Quest came out of that. And it came out of an idea that I had and threw it out into the world. Um, and it drew a couple of people. And then we built um, this framework, um, connection, ritual, adventure, and wisdom is our framework and we use and this will sound familiar through exchange we use the one path method which is what we call it um, but that's really being able to leverage the relationship with our past our present and that imagining our future through a new lens and how we can create ultimately what we want to be celebrating about ourselves or our leadership at a future point in time so adventure we this takes place in Costa Rica. This town of Nusara is, it felt really magical. We brought, my family's been going there. So we brought in what we call our soul family, um, amazing people to do food. And we've got, um, I mean, it's a very thoughtfully designed, um, not just to support our, we, it is to support the work that we're doing internally, but like we're nourishing people from the inside out with the food. And we actually even go to the land where the food is grown and the mm. intent of the people that are making the food for us, or, um, you know, even the, the journey that our surf instructor, we, we use uh, surfing um, as a metaphor for leadership and how we're showing up in our own bodies and like how we, we use energy and, you know, are we resisting? Are we able to go with the flow? And so, and that, and we, you know, our, our daily movements, we just, we have this beautiful family that's come together. And so that was our first, um, cohort. And it was, um, important to us that we, we, we did work that was transformational. And it was the first time we'd all done this work together. The three of us, um, it felt like magic when it all came together. And then when we unlocked the wisdom in the room, like there was not one person that left without some type of transformational experience or some kind of aha or awakening about their own leadership that was like, oh, I didn't even know I was allowed to do that or feel like that as a leader. Uh, so we've decided to do the next cohort, April 19th through 25th, 
2024 in Nosara, Costa Rica. And that after we fill that one, we will be, um, the goal is for us to offer um, probably four and then maybe up to six different events a year. We're going to build community behind it and then also have some support services. Because sometimes when leaders go on journeys um, and start to awaken the possibility inside of them, they have a whole team where there's like, okay, now, like, now where do I take all of this stuff? So our current cohort is helping, they're co-creating really the support services, how we support them on their journeys. And we're still walking together since April. Fantastic. Wow. That was a lot. That was a lot. Here's what I heard. I heard your soul family is there with you in Costa Rica. I hear there's amazing food. There's amazing camaraderie and connection with other great humans. There are people there for a real transformational journey. Uh, many different metaphors for leadership and life. There's movement. What it's not, what I didn't hear is we're in a room for just the next retreat. This is not the regular thing that you might have heard of. This is different and special and now, who's the person that might be interested in this? If, if there's an avatar of a person, who would this be uh, targeted to or who would be welcome here? Yeah, so we are, I mean, we're targeting senior leadership. Um, and we like for people to have five or more direct reports currently or at one time. We do feel that you know, there, there's part of us that feels it's important to build the next generation of leaders. But it's also important to build, and, and I would be this category, to harness the wisdom um, of perhaps leaders that have already built something okay. um, and, and how that are continuing on their own journey and still creating impact and change in the world. And so, you know, we would have some younger leaders and some older leaders, and we would have really good diversity. Um, so we just, we kind of have to see who shows up and who's called for that. And and I, I heard this quote, and I'll, I'll say it here, and I don't think we would put this on our website, but like, unfortunately, this work isn't for people who need it. It's for people that want it. So, so the people that show up at our retreat, like they understand that there is, they've at least been called on a journey. And so there's an awakening that there's more out there and there's a deeper level and there's maybe, um, you know, another version of me that I want to be celebrating in the next nine months or in the next year. And that's ultimately what we become really good at helping people do. And I get a lot of people that say, oh, you should have so-and-so. They really need this. Well, the people that need it are probably not self-aware enough to know that they need it. Um, mm. But hopefully over time, we can, you know, impact more and more people. Absolutely. But it's only, we only, there's only 12 seats. And for this upcoming cohort, we have three people returning from our first cohort um, that very quickly signed up and said they, they want to come back and do that again. So there's only nine spots left. Uh, and I remember clearly, and those of you out there listening, you can go and, and I know Michael Dietrich Chastain has been on the show before. Uh, and I remember seeing on his and on yours, and so I'm Facebook friends with both you guys, I remember seeing on your Facebook page some of the great pictures uh, that you took while you were there. Uh, so feel free to go out there, friends, and, and check them out. What, how might we find you out there on social media, Ron, if we wanted to check out pictures and, and see that experience, just find out more? How do we do yeah. that? Um, so the Conscious Leaders Quest is the best thing. If you Google us, you should find the website. Um, we're on Instagram at the Conscious Leaders Quest. And if you search Conscious Leaders Quest under um, LinkedIn and Facebook, you will find us there. Um, mm -hmm. And then for me personally, Instagram, I'm a Purpose Sherpa. Nice. Um, so I have this, yeah, just this idea that, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a coach. I'm not, like, a, sometimes I feel like, I'm a little bit ahead of people, but I'm not too far ahead of them. And so this idea of being a Sherpa and I really want to be able to accompany people on their journey. Um, and then we both become a better version of ourselves. So I love this idea of being a Sherpa. Um, so, and, and I do work with companies around building, um, how do we articulate purpose, mission, vision, values, behaviors. So I do some of that work. Um, 
as so well. there it is the uh, the purpose yeah, so it's, on it's, instagram yeah ron l hill at um on linkedin facebook yes uh, and if, if those of you who are you're listening to this, what does Ron look like? Well, Ron, just a couple things you'll you'll see in 2023. Ron has amazing hair, so you're going to see that hair. And if you see this on YouTube, you're going to see over in the background that Ron uh, has a friend over there on the couch. Uh, his, his friend Bodie is over there on the couch. Bodie is the uh, uh, the cat over there. I thought Bodie from Point Break. I was thinking Patrick Swayze, but you had a different. Uh, well, how did your cat get the name Bodie? Yeah, well, he actually came with the name Bodhi. So we go to yeah. Nosara, which is ultimately where we've been doing the Conscious Leaders Quest. Mm-hmm. And there's orange cats around, and they always come around. And then um, my wife came home from the pet store one day, and like, there's a cat there. His name's Bodhi. He's an orange cat. He kept reaching his paw out. And I'm like, well, we clearly are meant to have this cat. I have not always been the biggest fan of cats. Um and so this guy's really proven me wrong because he's been every I, I turn around and he's always somewhere lurking in the background. We're also we spend the summers in Bozeman, Montana. Um, so we actually drive across the country. And I said I would never drive across the country with a cat. I would never be the person with like literally a cat in a car. But <laughs> Mr. Bodie loves a good road trip. Excellent, excellent. I, I love at the purpose Sherpa and. Just a little bit ahead and, and guiding. I feel like from our exchange intersection where you and I connect, I feel like the guide on the side as opposed to the stage on the stage. And you're the guy on the side helping and not trying to take yeah. credit for helping the leader get wherever it is they want to go by this purpose driven you know mindset and awareness. And this is this yeah. has been fantastic uh, to have you on, Rod. Uh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I love how you, you yeah, I love how you just put that because that whole guide on the side of Sherpa thing was very freeing to me. Um, because I'm like, I'm not somebody that has all of the answers. I have some answers and I can have and I know where to find the answers, but I don't always carry all the answers around. So being a Sherpa or a guide, right? And then helping, you know, other people really step forward and figure out their own answers is a little bit of magic. I tell you, one of the magical things I've found, a magical quality of Ron Hill today for me, is that I've heard you ask some amazing questions. You know, and that might be the sign of an amazing Sherpa is, is the quality of your questions, because your questions have been really on point. And, and one of them, you know, who, what version of yourself might you want to be celebrating in a year from now? I love that question out there. So for great questions for a purpose-driven leader and experience and potential awakening. You know, check out Mr. Ron L. Hill on LinkedIn and consciousleadersquest.com and at consciousleadersquest on Instagram. And, and I'm sure you'll find Ron out there. Um, Ron, this has been amazing. Uh, we are now going to progress to the lightning round to wrap things up today. Ding, 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 lightning round uh, to, uh, to conclude. I'd love to ask you... Um, when you hear the name of our show, the Eternal Optimist mm-hmm. podcast, what does uh, Eternal Optimist, what might that mean to you, Ron? Um, well, it means to me it's abundance. And it's this idea whether you're, I've always thought of, you know, I think, you know, and I think your logo is it, right? Your glass half full, your glass half empty. I've always felt very buoyant and I've always felt like a glass half full. But it also now, to me, it means abundance. And we get to build um, a life right? That when we put on the lens of abundance, we see abundance. If we put on the opposite lens of scarcity, then we start to see and live in a scarce manner, which is not near as rich and rewarding. Awesome. We get to, I love it. I love it. Uh, If there is a book or a couple of books that have had an impact uh, in your world, you'd like to recommend uh, what might be one or two books that have had an impact on you, Ron? Um, you know, it's so funny. Like you're asking me that I'm looking around. I I have, um, I order books right and left. Um, and like my, literally my mind is going blank. I was looking at my, look at my closet at what's sitting on my shelf right now. Um, and my, my mind is literally going blank, but I know it's probably the same for you in exchange where like we have all these guest speakers that come on and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to buy their book or I'm going to get this book. And, um, so I buy way more books than I actually have time to read. 
Mm-hmm. Um, currently, I'm reading a book on um, the Greek gods. I got to go to Greece this summer and um, Ooh, visit cool. the Acropolis. And, and so I'm revisiting this uh, like really cool idea, right? And like the things that we learned from the Greeks and, um, you know, capitalism. And there was a, a guide that told us that in the ancient Greek city, they worked on creating safety because when people felt safe, they were more creative and they could build a better society. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the same work that we're trying to do in business today. Um, so anyway, so I just hopefully did a good job of skirting that I just completely went blank on a book title for you. No, that's great. I, I love that what I heard there uh, was that history can repeat itself. And you know the Greeks were studying ways to create safety so we could help people be their most creative. And, and the big buzzword in the last 25 years is psychological safety. So I love that you've uh, you've brought that up. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, there, I mean, they were doing this thousands of years ago, right? And we're we're still struggling to get that back to this day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a uh, a certain genre of music or uh, some band that ha- gives you some inspiration or gets you, that fills your cup, Ron? Well, you know, it would, uh, and this is generally true. I would say my partner Peter Katz. Um, so the song "Dark." Um, like it so resonates with me. And, um, I also love a lot of Rob Ricardo. I love music, um, that helps us along the journey that has like a great beat. And, um, as you know, in exchange, John's really introduced us to, um, music as an expression and how do we, we create abundance and how do we lift up? So, um, even before Peter Katz was one of my partners, I, I heard him on exchange and he became one of my favorites. And, um, but I, I'll tend to listen to my family listens to country music too. And so sometimes you start to hear all the, the words about things that aren't going right. And like, Oh, I need to put on my appreciative lens and listen to Peter Katz or Robert Cardo. One of these guys, Mm. Robert Cardo and Peter Katz. Uh, if we're talking exchange, I would say brother James is one of my uh, big ones we have here on our uh, Spotify uh, and I'm going to go get Robert Cardo and Peter Katz right away. I've heard Peter. I've cried listening to Peter sing before live. So I'm going to go and get Peter and Robert, Robert Cardo, Peter Katz, and put them on the Spotify. So thank you for that. Yeah. No, yeah. Brother James. Ab- yeah, absolutely. He is right in that genre. And um, I do have a little Brother James radio, too, on my Spotify. Nice. Nice. Ron, it's been a real sincere pleasure and honor to have you. We love you. We appreciate you. You've just been, thank you for opening up and sharing hard stuff and helping us to figure out one more piece of the puzzle on the way to, you know, being purpose driven and being aware and being able to let go of control. So thanks, brother. Um, Matt, thank you. I, I appreciate you. I love the work that you're doing. I love this idea on how you create this lens for um, optimism and um, all the conversations that and the work that you're doing to help leaders also be the best version of themselves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Game on. All done, baby.